of 10, everyone in the family thought baptism was in order. I didn't feel any different when I got up than when I knelt down. Control was the name of the game. I tried to control everyone in our little family and outside, including the nun who caught me stealing cold drinks in a convent. Another form of punishment that I felt was rejection. My mother married a man who later proved to be an addict. We moved to another city, and the war within me intensified. Continuous fighting at home created more fear and insecurities. When I was away, I hated my home and resented the people in it. Drawing upon different concepts, I began another way of living. It did not matter to me to what lengths I had to go in order to gain love and approval from everyone. Up went the false front with more dishonesty and deception. I was to spend many years of my life trying to be something that I was not. Release came at the ripe old age of 16 in the form of alcohol at a dance. Immediately my fear of girls was gone. My two left feet disappeared, and I knew exactly when and where to lay my newfound wisdom of people. The effect left, and I was back at war with me. 108. If you want what we have 109. I believe rules were made to be broken. Society's laws were not for me. They hampered my way of living, and I began to deal with reality the only way I knew, and that was using the drug alcohol. This is the only drug I was aware of in the late 40s, and I used it to ease the pain. At the time, it was the best way to cope with them. Anyone could punch my buttons if I thought that it was needed for their approval of me. After a small skirmish with school officials and city authorities, private school was necessary to finish high school. Two years of college proved even further that this world, and everything in it, was full of crap. I cared for no one at this stage of the game. However, I met a young lady who met all of my requirements. She was from an old family, very regal in appearance and possessed all of the social graces. We ran off and got married. I entered into a new relationship that I was not mature enough to handle. I fancied myself in the future as the old southern gentleman, broad brim hat, bowstring tie, overlooking his vast domain with a mint julep in one hand and a gold cane in the other. Material things were the basis for happiness in my life at this time. I look either up or down to people, depending on their seeming net worth. After attaining a lot of these things, happiness and peace of mind did not come. My salary as purchasing agent at a large hospital was not enough. Stealing to support my materialistic ambitions was necessary. The salesman soon found my vulnerable spot, wine, women and song. They began to supply my demands. Drinking and partying every night soon made a physical wreck out of me. In the latter part of 1954, I was introduced to a little goodie called Codeine by a salesman to draw a clean breath. Something was cruising in me every moment of every day. I was 21 years old and a full-blown addict. Routine encounters of addicts and alcoholics treated at the hospital convinced me that I was unique. I would never become like they were. The standards and expectations I set for myself and others were too high to be met. Negative thinking and escapism became my total personality. Greediness compelled me to study drugs and experiment. This may have saved my life while I was using. I feared certain combinations in trying to get off. 
the 60s came along, and I decided I needed a change. I left the hospital for what I thought were greener pastures and began to travel. Life was still hell. That old nest of negativism followed me everywhere that I went. Jobs came and went, then they came no more. The jails and hospital stays were more frequent and longer. 110 Narcotics Anonymous In 1973, I came into a mental ward, I was chained like an animal. My psychiatrist, who I constantly conned over the years, knew of my alcohol problem, but not of my other addiction. It was suggested that I try a 12-step program. My family was willing to try anything, so off I went for all the wrong reasons. People were kind and helpful to me, so I began to use them as I had others all my life. They had never seen me clean and dry, so how were they to know if I was using? I was very careful not to talk about too much of anything lest they become suspicious. Deception and denial were the games that I played and they almost killed me. At this time I had gotten off the hard stuff and onto downers, uppers and mood elevators. People seemed happy and sober, and I wondered what they were using. I do not believe there was a fragment of honesty in me at the time. Willingness to change never crossed my mind. Gambling, women and using were my bag. For over three years I lived in hopelessness and despair going back to using, and going back to the program. After hearing the higher power concept and about a spiritual way of life, I knew drugs were not for me. I had at one time a God graciously given to me by my environment, whom I did not understand. I knew this God did not want anything to do with someone like me. There were times when I tried to relate, but there seemed to be something missing. I sincerely think that even though my feelings seem to be the same as others, there seemed a lack of deeper understanding that I needed. God bless them they tried. There were no recovering addicts in the area and no NA. I looked for people with other drug dependencies and finally found one lady in the group. She had spent 10 years in and out without any success. Things did get a little better. There were no arrests and no stays in the hospitals for a period of two years. Then, in the fall of 1975, everything went to pieces. Back to the hospital I went. Exchanging the alcohol for pills, I was back in the old paradox again. Then, a series of events began that changed my life. There was talk of committing me to the state institution. My family no longer wanted me like I was. Two program members came one afternoon to see me and they both told me the same thing, that I wasn't crazy, to come back, don't move, and ask for help. My sponsor, who had fired herself several times from my case, picked me up and took me to a meeting. The girl who rode with us spoke that night. She talked about God of her understanding. Sitting next to my wife that night I began to see where I had missed the boat. I went back to that. If you want what we have 111. Dark room and thank God for those people, because somehow I knew they cared. Even though they did not understand many things about me, they gave me time out of their lives and asked for nothing back. I remember the 11th step in the program and I thought maybe, just maybe, if I asked for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry it out, he might help. I got a little brave, I knew that I wasn't honest, I added, P.S. Please help me get on it. 
It would be great to say that I left that hospital and never used again, but it didn't happen that way. It was almost like all the other confinements I had experienced. I came out of that hospital with exactly what I went in with. Me. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's passed just like a wink, blink and a nod, and I was still praying. Everything got worse. My family kicked me out the day after New Year's. I knew it was hopeless, but I was still asking for honesty. On or around the 5th of January, I began to ease off the pills I was using. It wasn't any fun, but I know today that all the suffering was necessary. Praying and tapering off had become my obsession. I felt that this was my last chance. I took my last pill, shot, etc. in March. By God's grace I was clean. People began to tell me, look what you have done, and I began to believe them. I got to looking so good to me that I just invited me out for a drink. What a rude awakening. I came off that drunk full turkey, no pills, nothing, for the first time in over 21 years. For five days I shook and I mean shook. On the fifth day, I wanted no more. I sat down in my little VW, bowed my head and told God, if this is all in life for me, I want life no longer. Death would be far more merciful. It doesn't make any difference any longer. I felt a peace come into me that I had never felt. I don't know how long this lasted, and it doesn't matter. It happened and that is the important part. Since then, I have experienced the same feeling from time to time. It was like being brought forward from darkness to light. God doesn't let me stay in the sunlight too long, but he will help me if I choose to stay in the twilight. I walked away from that car a free man. I did not realize this for a long time. Since that day, I have not had a desire to move. A God of my understanding had sent me enough honesty to get started down the right path. I went back to the program and again I made another mistake. I kept my mouth shut with the intention of letting the winners teach me how to become clean. Today I know that for me I walk a different path through addiction, and I had to walk a different path through this program. I had to learn about me. For almost two years in the program. 112 Narcotics Anonymous. I saw people come and go with addictions other than alcohol. One night in Birmingham, I was sharing with a group and also talking about drugs when a man approached me with tears in his eyes. He told me of his son and daughter somewhere hooked on drugs. He said, surely God must have some program for people like them. All the way back home that night I talked to a girl using drugs, a schoolmate of my wife. The telephone gave us the answer through some new friends from Georgia and Tennessee in Narcotics Anonymous. A visit to share in Chattanooga proved to be a blessing. Several people came up from Atlanta, including one guy from Marietta who kept telling people that he loved them. I was 44 years of age at the time, that was the first time a man had ever told me that he loved me. For some unexplainable reason, I also felt his love. A couple of months later, we went to Atlanta and found a repetition of our first trip. I wanted so much to give and feel as these people did. At the close of the dance that night, I overheard something that went like this, if you want what we have, you have got to take the step. I came back to Alabama and began to take the step. I learned about me and found a God of my understanding. 
trust God, clean house, help others, explain it as simply as I can. I spent many years looking for something around the corner, or someone coming down the street who would give me happiness and peace of mind. Today, through the steps and the people in NA, I have found a solution. I have to stay honest with me, stay open-minded enough to change and be willing to accept God's love for me through the members of NA. I am very grateful to our brothers and sisters in Georgia for their tolerance and support during our first year or so in the program in Alabama. They more or less sponsored me in those early days. Just knowing they were there was very comforting. Many times I called my friend in Marietta, despondent over the way things were going. He always seemed to have the answer. Keep the doors open and God will do the rest. NA groups now have sprung up in several cities and now those people are sponsoring me through their growth in NA and God's grace. I finally got it all together, but without God's help I forget where I put it. There is one thing that I feel I can give to every addict to use. I love each and every one of you, and most importantly, God loves me too. I found this love in the wonderful program of N.A., through God's grace and new people. Come join us. It works. I qualify 113. I qualify. My name is Iris. I'm a drug addict. In the beginning of my clean time, I didn't think N.A. was the place for me. Then again, the stories from the other fellowship didn't relate to me either. I knew that I wasn't as bad as these dope teens. Since that time, almost three years ago, my ideas have most certainly changed. I was the oldest of four children. I was the only one in my immediate family who had a drug problem. I figure that I started out as a pretty, happy kid. We didn't have much money, but we were close. Recently, someone said, a drug addict is nothing but an experienced escape artist. I can relate. My career of running or escaping started after a crisis at the age of 11. I went through a lot of pain and humiliation. At first I ran physically, later mentally. I escaped reality through books, TV, sleep, etc. I was very much a loner, but only because I felt no one wanted to be around me. I thought that I wasn't pretty enough, smart enough, rich or popular enough, and that I wasn't funny or witty enough. Everybody was better than I was. At home, I became the black sheep, causing embarrassment and shame. Once I tried to commit suicide thinking that the world would be better off without me. I started drinking and smoking pot heavily the summer after I graduated. I started a two-year college to be a secretary, because that's what a girl is supposed to be. In college, I couldn't handle the pressure. I went to a doctor complaining of headaches and was introduced to barbiturates. I started taking prescribed drugs. By the end of that first week I felt good. I felt so happy and carefree. I even liked iris. The day was nice and fresh, and I even bounced when I walked. I remember looking at the bottle of pills thinking, I'm going to hold on to these. And I did faithfully for the next three years. To put it simply, I thought pills were the answer to my problem. Then the answer became the problem. There was no real fun involved. From the beginning, I was using pills to cope. I remember somewhere along that. 113. 114 Narcotics Anonymous. 
Lying someone said, you're going to get addicted to those things. As long as they made me feel this good, I didn't care. Then I found out what addiction was really all about. After only six months of taking barbiturates daily, I remember going through my first withdrawal experience when I couldn't get anything. After that week, I thought I'd be starting over again. Little did I know, by this time, I had stopped drinking. I was a bit of a loner. Life was turning bad again. I had a car accident that I never dealt with. I started building a bigger wall around myself, and I needed something to calm me down enough to drive. I needed a little help to get me through work. I needed a little something for the courage to talk to people and even my family. Time became nothing but a gray haze where nothing seemed to matter. For me, therapy was a joke. I graduated college on the dean's list but couldn't sell myself, so I ended up with two part-time jobs. One was a Christmas job selling. There I learned to put on a show so that no customer would leave without a smile on their face. I felt that the show was all there was to my personality. In the other job, I was a clerk typist. Quickly, I came to believe that the girls there hated me. Out of fear, at a Christmas party, I decided to stop the pills and limit the drinks. By the end of the third drink, the party seemed to stop, and all I could think of was another drink. Back at the office, things got so bad that one day I came in with earplugs, and told everyone that I had an inner ear infection in both ears. If they wanted to talk to me, they had to tap me on the shoulder. That was one of the last bricks in my wall, blocking out the world. At home, I slept 10 to 12 hours a day. I tried to control and to even stop drugs, but I couldn't. I wondered what happened to the flower children and drug addicts of the 60s. Were they all dead? And what was going to happen to me? Depression was a normal state of mind. There was no conversation between me and my family. My only enjoyment in life was watching TV. I remember rocking back and forth in bed thinking, no one knows loneliness like I do. I felt like a walking corpse. The only emotion that I had was hate and that was directed at myself. Later, I found out everyone was waiting for me to commit suicide, they didn't know what to do. The only thing I remember of my family at that time was that my dad hated me. In that gray haze, my mom was a warm soft light that was out there somewhere. She always seemed to love me no matter what I did. I didn't understand. I qualify 115. When the time came that my higher power took control of the situation, against my will, a series of events happened that got me to break down and turn to my mom for help. I said, Mom, I think I have a problem with drugs. She said, well, we're going to the doctor's today. Maybe he can give you something to help. We were so ignorant, but it felt so good to share and cry. Things then started to move quickly. First came detox. I loved it. My own room, TV, telephone, and all the hot water I wanted. My own private world. I didn't have to deal with anyone. I only went to a rehabilitation center so that I wouldn't have to return home so quickly. I started to get into a romance until someone asked me, what do you have to offer him? I didn't have much to offer at that time, and I knew it. I did learn about drug addiction and was given some tools. 
Again, I only went to the halfway house because I didn't want to go home and back to my old way of life. At the halfway house, I learned how to live clean and to use the tools of recovery. The main tool, the basis of my clean time, was meeting. I attended my first NA meeting in the rehabilitation center. The only thing that I remember about that meeting was a man who looked so good that if he spoke to me, I'd melt. Later, I was told that it doesn't matter why you come in the beginning, just come. So I came. And I strutted, and I smiled, and I did what I took for a cookie, a compliment, a look, or a stroke. My ego needed anything it could get. At that time, I still didn't really know what being clean was all about, but I kept coming back. Eventually, I started coming for me. I realized that I'm a drug addict even if I did not take a great variety of drugs. I may not have done the things other drug fiends have done. I may not have gone as far down the road, but only because I didn't have the opportunity. I am a drug addict, not only because of the drugs, but because of the defects as well. Because of the lying, manipulating, conniving, self-will, thieving, and escaping, I qualify for this program. I also found that drugs were only a symptom of my disease. With meetings, help from the people in those meetings and my higher power, I started to grow. I got rid of the fear and the guilt. My confidence was restored. I learned to handle pressure and responsibility. I learned to reach out one hand for help and the other hand to help. I learned to make friends, and I learned to respect myself. I could go on and on. I'm growing by using the tools of the program. Thank God for the NA program. I'm alive. I'm free, and today, I have a lot to offer. 116 Narcotics Anonymous Why me? Why not me? My God, what am I doing here? Why am I in so much trouble? What am I going to do? Nothing had gone right for me in such a long time. Was I going crazy? Was there hope for me in this horrible existence that I called life? The only words that I could use to describe my life are fearful, desperate, aimless, and hopeless. As I thought of my past with remorse and disgust, I tried to think of anything that I had done or accomplished that was positive in any way. I had three beautiful children, a wife, two cars, a new house, and a good job. However, I could not think of a single thing in my life to be grateful for. I felt as though I was a complete failure, with nothing left to live for. For the past 14 years, I had been drinking heavily, and had experienced numerous consequences due to drinking, but I thought that was part of the game of being a responsible adult. I never liked responsibility and made a point to avoid it whenever possible. I was introduced to narcotics completely by accident. The accident was due to my drinking at 7 a.m. I suffered a broken neck in a head-on collision, and was taken to the hospital. I learned to enjoy the life, being waited on and having no responsibility. This was exactly what I had been looking for. Soap offers and narcotics. I recall the hospital staff telling me that I was an excellent patient. With all this encouragement, I devised many lies and cons to ensure a lengthy stay at their wonderful institution. Little did I know that I was setting a pattern of thinking that was to last many years. 
This pattern would be a very destructive force to my family and lifestyle. After being released from the hospital, I returned to Alpha.